You gave to that. You have such a part to play uh, in everything that you just saw. We put that video together so that you could see just where you're, you're giving, just where you're partnering, just what uh, impact the, what you did did in another part of the world. This morning, I, um, I wanted to show the video, and I wanted every single person from Cornerstone that went on this trip to be able to have an opportunity to share with you the way in which your investment in them and in this trip not only changed their lives, but changed the lives of people in Kenya. And that lady that spoke at the end there, her name is Martha, and she... Um, she has such a broad reach of the, the, the things that God has entrusted her with in Kenya. And for her to say those words to us, 
I want you to receive them, that, that there are lives that have been eternally changed because of your obedience to God to give when he laid it on your heart to give and to support and encourage the team that you sent from here, your friends and families from Statesville all the way to Kenya. So I want to say thank you, but I'm sure the team will say thank you as well. So Sophie, if you would like to go ahead and come. Good morning, y'all. <laughs> I was so blessed to go on this trip because around three years ago, I wanted, I decided, God told me that he wanted me to be a missionary. And this was my first missions trip. And I did not know what to expect. And it definitely was not that. <laughs> I saw so many people that needed our help, not only physically, but spiritually. I saw the beautiful country of Kenya. It was something that I never thought would impact me in the way it did. It showed me and it taught me so much about what I wanted to do when I'm older. It showed me how one person that had a vision, one person that had a want and a longing to go help others made this trip possible so that we could help over a thousand people. We did not only help, like I said, with physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. And I thank God every single day for that. It put a longing in my heart to do whatever I can to help people, to make others happy, to make others feel the love of God the way that I felt. And it made me happy to help others. Which might sound a little, this is the most sincere I can be. I was overjoyed. There's no words that can explain how happy I was to help others, how much I want to do this when I'm older, how much I want to go see the world and see the people that need Jesus. From the way that they worshiped, dancing and dancing and dancing and lifting up their voices to the Lord, I want to do more of that. I want to go see what God has in store for me, but not only for me, but for the church. And the church is every single one of us. I want to see what God can do. Not only where we already went. We went to this church, had people that went to Costa Rica, Kenya, New Zealand, all over the world. I don't only want to see what can be done where we already been. But I want to see how far this church can reach and reach other people for the gospel. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. That's my beautiful daughter right there. Um, I'm Mandy and I gotta tell you, talk about missions really fast. Missions, you start at home. Your number one mission field is your home, is your children. So to hear your daughter come on stage and talk about, that's, that's what it's about. So when a year ago, I will talk about my testimony of how I got to go to Kenya. A year ago, Renee put out a post that says, I want to put a team together. You know, you comment on the post, oh, I would love to do that. <laughs> oh, minutes later, do you have a passport? Oh, wait a second. I, oh, I have a passport, but yeah, it doesn't have a stamp in it yet, but I have a passport. And then I told Sophie, and of course, so I was like, this is it. This is, this is what I need to do because of not only for myself, but for my daughter who wants to be a missionary, spread the, the word. 
uh, share the light, which she does every single day anyways, but around the world. So I uh, literally, she put me on the team and I didn't know what that consisted of, but then messages kept on rolling in and then September came around and the tickets didn't drop. Tickets were at $2,200 a piece. $2,200. I'm like, she wrote an email saying, well, I'll have to know by next week if anybody's going to drop out or, you know, not going to be able to go because I can't afford it. I prayed. I was at work. And so um, I prayed and I said, Lord, I said, if you want, if you're telling me to go, if you're telling us to go, something's got to change financially with these tickets. Literally 30 minutes later, another email came in. The tickets had dropped $800 a piece. I said, Lord, this was your, this, this was the sign. This is what you, this is what you're indicating to me. So I, I literally, I called my mom. I said, I need a break for a second because I need to make this choice because she said immediately we need to book these tickets if you're going to get this price. So we had to put a down payment down. I prayed about that because that was a big amount for me at the time too. But I said, Lord, you know what you're going to do. And so we did, um, after talking to her dad and stuff, and I said, we have to make the decision now. After we made the payment that evening, I get the email confirmation that the ticket was in for to go to Kenya. I said, this is real. This is real. But yet, that wasn't it. I didn't have the money. The church was amazing. They, we only put a down payment down on the tickets. I still had to raise the money for the trip. And I didn't know how that was going to happen. Year out, months went, months went by. Um, money trickled in here and there. I was able to get Sophie, which was my primary focus, was to get Sophie's trip covered. And the Lord provided that. But yet there was me. Six months out, three months, no money. Three months out, no money. Month out, no money, no money. I didn't, I still owed $1,400 and I didn't know where it was going to come from. And I said, Lord, at least my daughter will be with the team. But I said, for, you know, and then one week, one week before I was supposed to leave on this trip, God laid on the people, your hearts, to give and to sow into me to sew into my daughter so we could go on the trip. And as the trip progressed, let me tell you, we got stuck in London. <laughs> we missed the connecting flight. It was too close that we weren't even going to make it anyways from Charlotte. The team, our team got separated, going to Dubai, going to Doha, going to every which way the team. And we wanted to keep the team together, but it didn't happen at that moment. But because of that, my, I will say it was, a, it was a blessing. My daughter and I got to experience something, have a moment together that we wouldn't have had. So in the long run, it was a blessing. And, um, but the thing I'm going to say is missions, Kenya. I met, let me tell you, I met a lady named Mary John. I met a girl named Millicent. I met a boy named Martin. I met a boy named Edwin. I met a wonderful teenage girl named Josephine and her sisters, Cynthia and Carol, and their mom. And these are all people. They're not numbers. They're not just pictures on a screen that you see a face. Those are names. Those are people that touched my life as I went there. So when we think about giving and you people say, yes, missions is here. Missions is at your home. Missions is in our backyard. Missions is, is down the street. But missions is in Kenya. Missions is in Ghana. Missions is in Haiti. But, of course, the Lord is the one that's going to guide you. If you hear the tug at your heart saying, this is where we need to be, this is where you need to go, then that's where you go. Missions is in West Virginia. So, I mean, I, so when you guys give, and yes, not everybody can go. I'm just blessed. This year I was able to go because wonderful people like you that felt the tug of the Lord gave money so that we could go and see people's lives changed. They gave their lives to Jesus, their number one. But they were 
There was lives that were, they got physically saved. There was a woman that needed medical attention so badly. We had, like, because of one of our team members, they were able to go to the hospital, and she saved her life. And that is the reason why we're there, to save lives through Jesus. So thank you, everybody. I want to leave with my time. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to go over to Kenya. Um, I'm just grateful to God. I'm grateful to you, Cornerstone Church, and so thankful um, for all your support and your prayers. I am so thankful to Renee for having a vision and a dream to lead a team over to Kenya to help aid people that are really, really in dire needs. Um, and her dream actually became all of our dream. And I'm just so grateful. The whole trip was really life-changing for me. Now, this is my first time doing a mission trip overseas. However, um, Sophie kept saying, when I'm older, when I'm older, but well, I am older. <laughs> I've, uh, I've um, actually been involved in a lot of organizations and, and assisted and aided in different organizations throughout my lifetime um, in, as far as helping people in need. And I tell you what, this, this particular experience has just been life-changing and overwhelming. And I can think back of all the people I met so many beautiful people, people who didn't have anything, but yet they had a smile. They, they just were just happy to see us, um, some sense of relief. And I tell you, that was just actually a wonderful, wonderful experience. And um, not to be too long, but I remember a little boy in specific, and the words that he said to me will never leave me. And the words that he said were, as we were leaving from one of the revivals, he said, leave me with something. His eyes, he had a hopeless look in his eyes. He just, his exact words were, leave me with something. Just leave me with something. Now, this mission team that went from Cornerstone and the various other churches, I believe we did just that. We left the word of God. We left love. We left a smile, we left medical care, people who would not have received aid, we left food, basic necessities, and with all of that, we left hope. We left hope, and you really think about that, we left hope. And, and like I said, I've been around for a while, and I, I wasn't exactly sure what all I was going to say. Leah Beth said something as I was coming into church today, and she said, well, just sing what you feel. So I'm going to just say, I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Oh, nobody told me the road would be easy. I don't believe God brought me this far to leave me. God bless you. God bless you. Wow. How do I follow that? <laughs> I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Be thankful. Yes. Yes. I just want to say it was life-changing. It was an amazing, amazing trip, and I am so blessed that the Lord opened the doors for me to come. It has been always a dream to go on a mission trip and to go to Africa. And when we came here eight weeks ago, I never thought that I would be going. And Renee asked if I wanted to go, and I was like, can I? At my age, old people go? <laughs> and uh, I went, and it was amazing. I just feel, though, I've really been praying about it since we got home, and I feel like I've left stuff there undone. I really feel like 
I need to go back. The Lord has showed me other things that I need to do for them and for myself. The thing that the thing that burdened me so much is every day hundreds of people came to the church in the bush where we were and so many people left without even seeing a doctor. They heard the word because we had pastors there and they spoke at revivals and sometimes we had a revival right there at the church. And they did hear the word, but a lot of them left. They sat in that really hot sun. Some of the people sat in winter jackets and hats and we're sweating. It was like really hot for us. And they sat out there and they have no water. We had water. The ladies from the different churches brought us food. We had break, we had lunch. These people sat outside, they had nothing. And my heart is that we need to build wells in these, church, in these communities. Um, next year, if we go back, we have to do something about giving these people water. And I thought about it, these people don't even have water in their homes. They don't, they don't have anything to carry water in if they had water. Those are the basic needs that everybody should have. So anyway, it was life changing. I'm glad that I went and my sister was able to be with me and she accepted the Lord. She said she accepted the Lord 24, 50 years ago when she was 20. And, uh, but she has been around people who love the Lord and serve the Lord. And I know this has made a big impact on her. So thank you very much for your support and your prayers. God bless you all. Good morning, Cornerstone. I can't tell you how great it is to be here and worship with you this morning and just let the worship wash over us. Um, it was uh, kind of healing to have that worship this morning just together with my family here at Cornerstone. Um, I've been on some mission trips previously before, but this one was unique in many ways. Part of it was it was very physically demanding, but also the fact that there were a lot of people there that knew Jesus. However, the need, in my opinion, Albert, could you put up my verse for me, please? Um, this summed up, for me, this summed up our trip. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There was people saved. There was, we had five pastors preaching amazing crusades every day, and they preached the house down. Let me tell you, they did a great job, all of them. All of them did wonderful, and there was people saved. But I felt, to me, the biggest need was to equip build up and help the body that is in that place because the need is great and they can't go out and preach to others when their own personal need is so severe. And um, I just wanted to share two, two main stories that really hit home to me about uh, what I experienced, God, God moments, if you will, um, that just really where God showed up and showed off. I love it when God does that, don't you? I mean, there's nothing like it. So we were in this clinic on the second day. And for me personally, second day was the hardest day. Um, we, it was a scramble to try to get everybody organized and what we were going to do and what have you. And this morning on this day, I was taking a blood pressure of a woman. And there was a lot of high blood pressure people with no medications, no, no way to get access to medicines. But they did have some medicines there that were being given. This woman had a blood pressure. I had just finished taking it, 200 over 100, which is, if you don't know, that's like stroke level right there. And as soon as I finished taking it, she started to have a seizure. And she started seizing. And the do I called for the doctor to come over, the Kenyan doctor that was there. And I said, you know, do you have Versed? Do you have Ativan, anything, you know, that we can give this woman? No, I didn't have any of that stuff. He had some blood pressure medicine that he put under her tongue to help with the, the high blood pressure, but really nothing for the seizure. And she just kept seizing and seizing. They moved her 
Next slide, please. They moved her into the corner. They put her in a couple chairs onto the, this credenza right there, propped her up against it, and like, there's nothing we can do, you know? She just sat there seizing. Well, if you have long-term seizures, it can cause brain damage. And being from America, as a nurse in America, I'm used to being able to help people, treat patients. When you don't have anything to treat people, you have the Lord. That's what you have. That's all you have. So I went over there, I laid hands on her, I started praying everything that I knew to pray, and then when I ran out of words, Holy Spirit had words. I just started praying in my prayer language for like 15, 20 minutes while she was seizing. I was just laying hands, praying in my prayer language, and the Holy Spirit just came over me. I just started weeping and weeping. I couldn't get myself under control. I'm like, come on, pull it together, Brenda. And I couldn't. I couldn't. All I could do was just cry and cry and cry for not only for her, but for all of these people that needed help and did not have the help that they needed. And then that morning where we had, before we had gotten there, I'm going to back up a little bit in my story. Before I had gotten there, um, that morning before we left, I knew that we were going to come against spiritual attack. I woke up at two or three in the morning and the Lord dropped it in my spirit to be praying against what we were going to be facing that morning. Same with the other, pa the other um, nurse that went with us, Greg, same thing. He said two, three in the morning, the Lord dropped it in his spirit to be praying against spiritual attack. And he had started having chest pains. One of our other members started having chest pains. We had some, a little bit of conflict it, trying to get things organized with our team. I ended up having to apologize to like three different people in our team that morning. I mean, it was, it was on with the enemy, right? And he was trying to work it with this woman. And as she was having this seizure, and I was praying over her, and she started to come to a little bit, I saw in the corner of her eye, she looked over this way, and I saw it in her eyes. If you've ever encountered people with spiritual difficulties, you know what they, that looks like. Well, this is what that looked like, and we kept praying. And then finally she calmed down, and I went over to um, back to the job that I was doing in our triage team. And then all of a sudden it happened. And Renee walked over to me and she said, did you feel that? And I said, I sure did. Holy Spirit came in. Whew. I mean, the whole place just went whew. Calm down. It was quiet. All the babies that had been crying were quiet. Everybody was quiet. Everybody was doing their work, and we were able to work from there. And it was absolutely amazing. Uh, do I have time for my second story? I know I'm out of my time. <laughs> I promised five minutes, and I lied. I'm sorry. Okay, one more story. All right, my other God story. Keep going, Albert, if you would. I was going to share this part. Keep going. I'm not. Keep going. Keep going. So when we were leaving... This is the house that we parked at for lunch. We traveled seven hours from our, uh, from where we were to get towards Norobi to go to the uh, airport. We had traveled over bumpity roads for seven hours, made multiple stops on the way, and we pulled up in front of this house um, and had a wonderful lunch. Keep going, Albert, if you would. And there's our team having lunch there. When we were leaving lunch, keep going, Albert. And we were leaving for uh, get out, and our driver. This is uh, <laughs> this is this is uh, Collins, and he had told our driver as soon as we pulled up, keep going. Next picture, our driver David. This is our driver David. He told him all the brake fluid just went out of your van when you stopped. So he parked behind his van. He saw all of the brake fluid come out. We had traveled seven hours across Kenya. Dangerous roads. Keep going, Albert. Next slide. That's our van we were in that we didn't get to continue in. They moved us into another van. But seven hours, and we made it. And when we stopped for lunch, all that brake fluid was gone. And we, if we would have got back in there, we would have had no brakes. I was in that van. Uh, CJ was in that van, and um, like four other people were in that van. So all your prayers, I just want to say, all your prayers for safety for all of us on that trip were answered. That was God. And I just want to give him all the praise. He did so much. I could go on and on, but I will not. And here we go. You're, you're not too young to go on a missions trip, and you're not too old. And I'm going to go back next year. I don't know the dates yet, but we're going to get those out. And there's room for you. 
You know, when adults often gather at a house and they're sitting on the porch and they're having conversations, where do the children usually end up? Do y'all not having children? They end up right at your feet, sitting around, listening to what all the adults say, right? Especially if you get a phone call and you're like, go, go play. You say, get off the porch. Get off the porch and go play. I feel like that's the word for our church is oftentimes we get real comfortable being on the porch, sitting here. And the Lord wants us to get off the porch and go because it's really exciting once you get off the porch. And I want to encourage you, um, these pictures are hard to look at when I tell you what they represent. These were people who were not served in the clinic. And they stood in the window and watched. And we could not, we, we physically could not service any more people. They also had no food and they watched us eat. And they had no water and they watched us drink water. This was when we closed the door to this clinic. And these people begged and pushed on that door because they needed help. There's a little lady, you can't see her, she's buried behind these people. She grabbed my arm and just pleaded that I would open the door and let her in. She pleaded. At one point, we had to just push our way through the crowd and go in and shut the door. And three people stood behind the door, and we stood there an hour, and they would not leave. They would not leave. They were so desperate. The need is very, very, very great. The next slide um, that was the last church we were at, and we shut the gate. And we couldn't help them. We couldn't help them. But we can go back. Those villages have not had any medical care in eight years. We were the first team to set foot with medical care in eight years. And it pains me to think that they're going to wait a year before anybody comes back to help them because it'll be our team that goes back. And I want to tell you that my children served, my 12-year-old served in the dental clinic eight hours a day being used by the Lord. You are not too young and you are not too old to be used by the Lord. And the field is ripe for harvest. And there is a world. We hit five villages. That's it. In five days, we hit five villages. We personally provided physical care to 1,150 people. And we distributed food for 7,500 people and preached two crusades a day for five days. We worked hard. But I want to tell you, the reward is great. But there are still people waiting. They're waiting for us to come back. They're waiting for us to come back. And my heart resonates with Catherine. I do not feel like our work is done. I don't even feel like it's close. There's so much. So thank you for helping us get there. We had a missions banquet in October, and the people that came to the missions banquet gave all the money to fund all the clinics. The food, the clinics, the doctors, all of that we did was $19,000. So we helped 1,150 people and 7,500 people with food for $19,000. If you do the math, it's about $15 a person. Such a small investment. And the missions banquet paid for every bit of that. And so for those of you who came to the missions banquet, Victoria helped me organize that and gave. You paid for multiple souls. Kenya, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you pick that up for me? Thank you. Awesome. Well, I hope you have tasted a little bit of what we have been doing for the past few weeks. It was very powerful. I want to say that um, there were so many amazing things. I don't know how to pick 
to really share with you, but I do want to share just two quick things. One of them was we got the opportunity, a few of us got the opportunity to go to the prisons. And we were in a prison. I was in a men's prison surrounded by 800 prisoners. I have seen the jails in America. I think as a high school student, you go through a tour. Maybe it's to scare you straight. I'm not sure. But the jails and prisons in Kenya are different. And um, we were... I wasn't even supposed to preach. I had a headache. I wasn't even supposed to really be there. Our flights got all messed up, and I ended up going, and we were surrounded by 800 prisoners, and there was probably 500 that were in the, popu- in the middle area. The prison could probably comfortably hold 300, but there was 800 at this prison, and we were in the center, and the people that weren't allowed to be in the center were behind gates, behind p- prison bars with their hands and their heads peering through. And as I shared and Randall shared, we gave an altar call, and there were people that raised their hand. There was about 30 that came up for prayer, and we gave an altar call for those to give their lives to Jesus. And there was one or two people right there that lifted their hands that we prayed for. And as we were praying, they unlocked the prison doors, and they escorted three more prisoners out to receive Jesus. And it was like the prison doors were being opened and they were being set free spiritually from what was keeping them bound. It was very, very powerful. And the other thing I want to share is that there is plenty of opportunities that go above and beyond what we were even able to do this time. There are nine churches in nine villages that need support, pastors that need training, villages that need equipping. Um, not only that, there's, there's other tribes deep in the Maasai Mari that we had divine interactions with. I've been invited to go back and go uh, into the villages of the very, very tribal people. It's, it's incredible opportunities. So I want to tell you that as Cornerstone, as a family, we're going to be praying over the next month or two about what does our missional giving look like. What does it look like for us to partner together? One person could not have done what you just saw. We took a team of 26, but we were backed by many different churches and by you. And so we're going to be reevaluating what it looks like to partner in mission, to reach other nations for the gospel. This morning, I want to tell a story about Joshua for just a few minutes. You know, the, the great general Joshua, as he took over the reins from Moses... But as he was getting in his older age, in Joshua 12, we see that that he begins to recount his victories. I want to tell you what we just did, our victories. We saw lives changed. We saw people fed and ministered to medically. But we see Joshua at an old age described in verse 13, verse 1. Albert, if you would pull that up. It says, now Joshua was old and advanced in years When the Lord said to him, now I'm going to stop there. What he was doing previously was sitting back and counting his victories. He was complacent. But that changed when God said to him, you are old and advanced in years. He was reminding him, I guess. Uh, And very much, and very much of the land remains to be possessed. So so Joshua was thinking to himself, look at all that we have conquered and done, and it is good. And God said, very much remains to be possessed. This is a bit of complacency and apathy. And God's word cuts through that and says there's more to do. I want to tell you, this is the beginning of what our relationship with Kenya looks like. Because very much of the land remains to be possessed. Joshua had gained and conquered so much, yet there was so much more. You see, the words from God here, very much of the land remains to be possessed, were to break Joshua free from apathy and complacency. And the definition of complacency is this, uncritical satisfaction with oneself. Uncritical satisfaction with oneself. You know, I I feel very dissatisfied with what we did in Kenya. I feel very dissatisfied because the need is so great. You know, the evangelism 
the, the evangelistic effort in our world today is not being done by Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, Billy Graham. It's being done by you and me. Those of us who sit in churches, who pray, who fund mission, and who say yes to the call of God to go. You know, I don't want us to, to get caught up with saying, well, I've served God for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I've always done this. I'm here to say there's more for you to do. It isn't just about getting to the end of your life. Or getting old, it's about saying yes to where God is calling you to do, what he's calling you to do and where he's calling you to go. There were people over 70 on this missions trip. And they had more energy than me. <laughs> and I think one of the biggest reasons we get complacent and apathetic, hear me now, is because we don't think God is still speaking to us today. If you think... If you believe in your heart that God is still speaking today, then you will turn your heart to listen. You know, I've been reading, and, and recently I've learned that there really isn't a Hebrew word for obey. We translate that word in the Bible in the Old Testament to obey, but the word is shema, and the word shema means hear. Because you see, hearing in, the old, in Hebrew came with action. If you heard something correctly, it led you to action. In John 10, Jesus says this. Albert, can you put the, the next verse up? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Question for you. Was Jesus only talking about the sheep that were alive then? This is a question you're going to have to ask yourself. Or is Jesus talking about all of his sheep hearing his voice? Because if they're hearing his voice, it means what? He is speaking. So if you believe that Jesus, if you believe Jesus, this is the Bible, I can't make you believe this, but if you believe, this is a settled theological fact. His sheep hear his voice. He's still speaking today. Our ability to hear him grows with our relationship with him. And if you think, I want you to reflect deep down, do you believe that God speaks today and that he is speaking to you? Because if you don't, then you are wrong. Because God is speaking and he wants to speak to you. The reason our Kenya team went to Kenya was because we felt God speaking to us. I'll, I'll be honest, when I came overseas, I had no desire to go to Kenya. I, I honestly had no desire. But God began to place a burden on me which has only continued to grow. Here's another question about God's voice. What kind of father adopts a son and on adoption day says, you won't hear from me again? I have never seen a good father never speak to his children. So if you want to learn how to hear his voice, read the Bible. Because everything that God wants to say to you aligns with everything he's already said. And I like what Preston Morrison says is, if I were your enemy, I would try to get you to believe that your father never wants to speak to you. Because if you're in a relationship with someone who never speaks, then distance is created. He is the God who speaks and his children can hear his voice. Amen? Amen. I hope you are dissatisfied with what you saw on the screen and what, with what you heard. I would love for each and every one of you to go with us next year and the year after. We don't know what our missional giving and endeavors are going to look like in the future, but I can promise you this. We're going to pray and discern where God is calling us to plant our missional flag and stake in the ground. And we're going to do everything we can to be obedient to where God is calling us as a church. Amen? You have a part to play in this. You were, honestly, your giving is very much as if you were there on the ground doing what we did. But there is no substitute to that experience of being on the ground there serving the least of these. And we don't know what God is going to do through us, but I'm excited because we get the opportunity to be his hands and feet wherever he points us. And together as a church, we're going to do it. Sound good?
Let's pray. Holy Spirit, lead us. The need is so great that on our own we can't even meet but a fraction. But your word says some plant seeds and some water it, but God, it is you who bring about the harvest. And so we open our, our, our lives to you and we ask you to lead us. We, we thank you that you're speaking. We ask you to help us hear because the work has only just begun. There is more land to be possessed for the kingdom of God. And we at Cornerstone want to be a church that says yes whenever we hear your voice leading us forward. We give you the glory for every single good thing that happened in this trip. It isn't by any one of us that goodness came. It is by your spirit moving. And we thank you that you allowed us to be your hands and feet in obedience in Kenya. God, we thank you that this is not a place of complacency or apathy. But this is a place that will continue to seek your leading and say yes to your calling. We thank you. And we say in faith, we will say yes to where you call us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who came up to share about their trip. And thank you for being obedient. Um, so following on, on another missions trip, we have um, one to West Virginia coming up. So Nick and Ashley um, will be going in a few weeks. So we'll be taking an um, offering. And Kelsey? Yes? Awesome. And more people, if you're interested, please come and talk to Nick and Ashley. Give, give a wave after the service. So we'll be taking an offering next Sunday for them to cover uh, the trip and um, how they'll be helping the local community there in Welch. And because it'll be July the 3rd, next Wednesday, not this coming, there won't be um, Wednesday night church service here. All right. And Caleb has one more announcement. Uh, during the worship service, uh, Brianna, if you'd like to come forward, felt that God gave her a word about how God is still working today. And I think it would be fitting for her to share. Okay. Well, uh, last night I was writing a love letter from God to me. And one of the things that he said was, Brianna, even now I am working. And this morning he told me, Brianna, that, that word is not just for you. Um, it's for everybody here that I am working and I will do mighty and wondrous things through people that they don't even know, through things and places that they didn't know existed, through my power, you will accomplish great and mighty things and do mighty works. Like in the Bible, you are all beautiful people and you can do what God has called you to do. You can do everything that God has called you to do. Your dreams, your visions. He's got you in the palm of his hand. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming this morning. It's wonderful to see all of you again. Um, make sure that you like and share our Facebook post because it is going out and it is reaching people. And more people are hearing about what God is doing here. And uh, we want to see every seat full. So um, not, not just so that every seat's full, but so that more people can partner in what God is doing here at Cornerstone. Awesome. Have a wonderful day. God bless.